excited. It feels odd being up here after being gone for a while, but I'm back. <laughs> um, I'm excited. The Lord is doing a lot of good things in my life. A lot of changes happening. I'm growing my hair for the first time in 16 years. <laughs> so it feels weird looking at myself in the mirror. <clears throat> Anyway, uh, so the Lord has been speaking to me about plans, and I was thinking about this this last week, and I have three scriptures that I want to share. Uh, Proverbs 19, verse 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 through 9. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs his spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured he will not go unpunished. Thy steadfast love and faithfulness, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one turns away from evil. When a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues with justice. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. One thing that I have noticed in my journey as a Christian is I can have many plans in my mind and my heart that I think is what's best for me, but God continues to, he continues to prove to me that it is not my way, it is his way. <clears throat> because every time that I try to execute one of the plans that I have in my mind, it's not that it's a bad thing, but when I let him instead direct my steps, it turns out so much better mm -hmm. than what I had anticipated or, or imagined. <coughs> and I think that's why all the things that are happening in my life right now are happening. So I have decided to relinquish whatever control I can exert over my life to him and listen. Sometimes it's a little hard to do because we're human. Mm -hmm. We don't want to lose all control. We have things. <clears throat> but that's what he's been showing me um, as I have allowed him to, to guide me instead of just me <coughs> going against what he's trying to do or trying to fight it because there's things that I have in my mind that I want to, to accomplish. Life turns out so much better when we just let him guide us instead of, of us trying to force our way And then Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24 say, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds <coughs> his hand. Even when we're allowing God to direct our steps, there's going to be things that are going to be thrown our way, that we're going to encounter along this path, that are going to try, try to get us to fall, stumble, and we might, but one thing that comforts me is that I know that he's never going to let go of my hand, Amen. that it's always going to happen, yeah. and when I fall, he's going to be like, nope, I got you, and he's going to pull me back up so I can continue. Amen. I urge you to just let him do what he wants to do in your life, even uh, if you're already doing it now, just do it some more. There might be a little bit of control issue there. Just let it go, and all the things are going to happen. And, and guarantee you. <coughs> so that's what I've been shown this week. You want to share that? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. <coughs> Any prayer requests or testimonies this morning?
Yeah. Uh, it's hard to 
people, those that are out in this world, spreading your word and serving your purpose, working to extend the kingdom. We ask, Lord, that you keep them safe and protected, that your divine protection, Lord, is with them wherever they go, that your light, Lord, shine over those lives that they are touching, Father. We declare the healing on all of those that are under some sort of illness or disease right now, Father. We know that you have declared us here, Father, in Jesus' name. We also pray, Lord, that all the generations, the new ones, the, the, the ones that are now going out into this world, <coughs> joining the workforce, that are able to go and go to know and understand that they matter, that they are important, Lord, yes, Lord. and that their voice will always be heard. Thank you, Father, for, for choosing us as your children. For we are important to you, Lord. And we come to you, Holy Father, yes, Lord. Thank you for all the wonderful things that you do. Thank you, Father, for loving us the way that you do. It's all about you. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, Father. Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. It's all about you. Thank you, Jesus. Friday, February 12th at 7 p.m. We'll have our Eastern Gatehouse prayer. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Just come. We need y'all. There's a lot of stuff going <coughs> on in the atmosphere. Some of it we already talked about. <coughs> be a time of prayer, intercession, worship, praise, praying for each other, praying for needs. A lot of needs. And you just, the Lord's just waiting for us to release those demands and February 25th. All right. Let's speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? <clears throat> I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus is 
Go ahead and bring the podium mic down. Go ahead and bring the podium mic down. Hallelujah. 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 Local radio stations trying to bleed in our system here, so we'll ignore it. <laughs> we'll broadcast back. Hallelujah. <coughs> Y'all ready? Can you put me on this one? I'll get it. Suzanne's retuning. <laughs> Temperature changes, atmosphere changes. Y'all ready? One, two, three, four. <laughs> There's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there, we can live there beyond time. Because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your blood, oh. Our sins are washed away, and we will live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face, and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. No more pain, no more sadness, no more suffering, no more tears, no more sin, no more sickness, no injustice, no more death. Because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your blood, oh. joy everlasting there is gladness there is peace there is wine ever flowing there's a wedding there's a feast because of you because of you because of your love because of your blood oh We will live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face, and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. We'll see you face to face. Oh, we'll see you face to face. And we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. Jesus, there is power. 
break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every
Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are greater than cancer, that you are greater than the wisdom of doctors, Lord, that you are the healer, Lord, that by your stripes, yes, Lord, Yes, Lord. Lord. We are kingdom, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus, holy name. Hallelujah. 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 There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain, even cancer. To break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Do you believe? There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. To break every chain. To break every chain. Come, come. 
to the table of the Lord. Come, come, come. He will take away your worry. His yoke is easy. His yoke is light. He'll turn your morning into dancing overnight. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, come, come, come. Don't delay. Coming back has never been so near. Come, 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 don't fall back any further. Throw off your fear and make a change. Get right with God in Jesus' holy name. I call to every tribe and tongue. Hallelujah. I call the north. Come. I call the south. Come. I call the old man. And I call the young. God has mercy on the sinner. Come, 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 all you who are lost. Come, 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 he will fill you with his spirit. You've got to come. Say, say you lost. Jesus is Lord by hanging on the cross. Knowledge of the Lord. Come, come, come. Creation. Throw down your idols. Take up your cross. Let's rise together. One nation under God. I call the East. Come. I call the West. Come. I call to every tribe and tongue. Hallelujah! I call the north. Come! I call the south. Come! I call the old man. And I call the young. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I call the east. Come! I call the west. Come! I call to every tribe and tongue. Hallelujah! I call the north. Come! And I call the south. Come! I call the old man. And I call the young. Oh, come. Come.
come to the knowledge of the Lord. Oh, come. Hear the grace, the flowing river of grace flowing down. Hear it coming, hear it coming, the mighty rushing river that rages in our path. Come here, come in the presence of the Lord. Come in the presence of the Lord. There is fullness in the presence of the Lord. There is fullness in the presence of the Lord. from the river, church. Drink from the river. There is no one, no one like you. Wonderful God, you are amazing. You created people to save.
saw the Lord seated on his throne. He was clothed in glory. <laughs> Exalted high. And the train of his robe filled the temple. around him and cry you are holy oh so holy you be impossible to them that believe. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I think, uh, I was thinking on the way to church this morning, how uh, this is a small church, obviously, that goes without saying, but we don't, you know, we may not see things that are happening 
and uh, in the spirit. But they're happening nevertheless. And I thought, I believe it was the Lord, saying that uh, <coughs> if we wanted to know <coughs> what God is doing here, we could, we could just shut the church down. And the chaos that would ensue. And you can take this for whatever it's worth to you. But I do believe that we make a difference. Amen. Or we wouldn't be here. I say, well, there's still stuff going on. We don't know how bad it could be if there wasn't something here between the enemy and what God wants to do. And God's got to have a body. He's got to have people, amen, to do it. So sometimes it's easy to get discouraged and think, well, you know, my, my life or my influence really doesn't seem to mean that much. Well, we won't know until you're gone. And then it'll be too late. So I think we ought to celebrate everything God's doing. Amen. Amen. Whether we're seeing it or not seeing it. Everything starts in the spirit anyhow. Praise the Lord. It has to be there before it can ever be here. And uh, I believe that's how God is able to transfer what he's doing from the spirit realm into the natural realm. Because we're spirit beings, even though we have a body, the body is what gives us legitimacy in the, on this planet. But it's the spirit that allows God to be able to, again, come to this planet and do what only God can do. So don't ever take yourself lightly. Don't ever think that you don't have any purpose or any value. Because every one of us is critical to what God wants to do in this world. Amen? And uh, I believe that just like with, with what Connie said, you know, who's going to stand up when you get the, I was reading the report. I mean, everything about it is negative. Everything about it is just might as well start digging the grave because this guy's done. But it ain't over till it's over, praise the Lord, and it won't ever be over as long as somebody will stand on what God has declared to be true. Praise the Lord. We've got plenty of witnesses right here in this church where God has moved, where there were situations that doctors had already said, this doesn't look like it's ever going to change, or you're going to have to have this treatment or that treatment or this other thing. And God supernaturally, because of somebody's faith, because somebody believed in what God had said, there's people sitting here right now today that might not have otherwise been here. Praise God. And I'm one of them. Hallelujah. I was diagnosed with hepatitis C years ago, and they were all they wanted to do was worry about a liver transplant. Praise the Lord. But we prayed and believed God and confessed what God said for over a year until finally the doctor said, you know, I've told this so many times, but uh, if I didn't have this stack of records in front of me showing all the tests that have been done for the last 13, 14 months, whatever it was, I'd have to say you never had hepatitis C because there's no trace of it anywhere in your body. And we have that report from multiple sort of people, not just about me, but about their situations, about their att the attacks that the enemy put on them, uh, sickness, disease, cancer, you name it. And we're still here, praise the Lord. Amen. And we're here for one because of one thing, and that one thing is Jesus. Amen. That one thing is the finished work of the cross. By his stripes we were healed. Yes. As long as somebody will stand up and declare it, it ain't over. Praise the Lord. It'll, amen. it'll go on, amen, as long as there's somebody breathing here on this planet and confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord and the answer to every situation and circumstance. Praise the Lord. Let's give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I, uh, I'll brag a little bit, but our, our uh, I guess she's our youngest granddaughter, uh, just turned five in January. She called the other morning. Now, she calls, she calls me Popo, and not Poo Poo, by the way, Popo, and that's Nana. And the reason for that is because they've got Grandpa and Grandma on the other side. So to not confuse them, they use different names so they can identify which grandparents we're talking about here. But anyway, she called, had my daughter call, and got on the phone right away and said, uh, talking to Sally, and she said, I want you and Popo to pray in Jesus' name. This is a kid just turned five. And uh, said, I want you and Popo to pray every night when you go to bed in Jesus' name for me, for baby, and for mom and dad. Because everybody's got the flu at that time. Well, except Bubba. She didn't want us praying for Bubba because he didn't have the flu. 
Or maybe she just doesn't like Bubba as much as the other two. But nevertheless, <laughs> if you got kids, you know what I'm saying. And that wasn't good enough. Then she had to talk to me. So she called on my phone so she could tell me the very same thing. And she made it specific. In Jesus' name, make sure you pray. In Jesus' name, every night. And then when you have breakfast in the morning, pray again. So you don't realize, and we don't beat these kids over the head with the Bible. We say grace, and we pray for them, you know, if they've got a boo-boo or whatever, you know, and we'll pray and so forth. So it's not like we're, we indoctrinate them like you would with some ism, you know, some, some political, you know, thing. But just... It's just natural, and we don't think anything of it. And you don't realize how influential you can be with kids. And after all, this is it. This is the next generation. I mean, without them, there won't be another generation. Amen? So, and, and you don't have to be a religious nut. You know, you just be Nana and Popo, you know, and just be yourselves. And, and you'll, you'll see that it, 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 their, their hearts cry out for this. It's in, it's in every human, the Bible teaches us. That it's in every man to know that there's a God and hunger for that God. Yes. Praise the Lord. So don't ever think you're insignificant. I mean, everybody has a purpose, and that purpose is so much greater than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. God wants to do something fantastic, Amen. and he's going to do it through us. You know, I was thinking when we're talking about praying in Jesus' name, I mean, I know we always say in Jesus' name. That's really not the point. And I, don't ha I mean, I'm not, there's not a problem with that. But the truth is, if you're a believer, you're in Christ. You cannot pray in any other way. Yeah. Right. You have the name of Jesus. We are betrothed to him. We have his name. He has given us his name. Yes. Praise the Lord. So when we pray, we pray from that reality, from that identity. Yes. And that's the whole purpose for all that we do here in terms of Talking about grace and everything, a lot of times I think people come and, and I don't want to, you know, say anything out of line here, but, you know, we, had, we have guests from time to time, and uh, uh, we, last week, uh, without going into a bunch of stuff, we had some people that are, you know, they're, they're from a different background. I mean, they're, they're Christians, but this is a whole different teaching. And we assume that everybody's where we are, that everybody... <coughs> thinks about God and our relationship with him the same way. And we forget that if you took me back 25 years ago or 28 years ago when I first started preaching, I had a whole different message. Now, Jesus was still Lord, and it still took him for salvation, but I didn't know what I know today. And if somebody had come up to me back then and started preaching directly to me what, what I preach today, I'd have probably got up and left. Or I might have been polite enough to sit there through it, but then I'd have walked out and said, you know, too bad they're lost. <laughs> you know, I mean, they mean well, but, you know, they're just messed up here. So we, you got, we have to be sensitive to people who come and recognize, I don't mean that they're, I don't mean ignorance. I, I mean, probably most of them have a higher IQ than we have, or that I have anyway, I'll speak for myself. But... But they can still be ignorant of the Lord, ignorant of what God really wants to be in their life. And we can't just assume that everybody knows everything that we know or that has the same depth of relationship as we. Praise the Lord. And, you know, you can, you, you can study. You can teach. You can do all kinds of things and still really not live the thing that you teach. Amen. I mean, you, you know what I mean? I don't mean a sinner. I just mean you can declare healing and deliverance and you can confess healing and deliverance, but it, it's something that has to get down inside of us. And that's why we're repetitious. And some people would say redundant. But look, it's by hearing that we are transformed. It's by the word of God that we are, that our minds are changed. That we're able to repent. And that doesn't mean, oh, my God, I'm so sorry I'm a jerk. Repentance is simply changing our mind about God. I mean, there are people who, for years, I mean, growing up, I never thought of God as a healer. I thought he was just Savior. I mean, that's all we were ever taught as kids was Jesus is Lord. And, you know, if you're good and when you die, he'll save you. He'll, you'll go to heaven. He'll save you from hell. But we were never taught anything about healing or 
or deliverance or, or anything like that. It was all about the, the future, all in the, in the here, you know, in the, in the uh, to come. God hasn't changed. But it took hearing a message about healing. It took hearing it and hearing it and then beginning to see how God would actually do these things to change the way we think about God. I just thought God's up there. He almost, I was almost like a deist, you know. I just believed that there was a God, but he's kind of dis disconnected from everything down here. He just it was kind of a crapshoot. He rolled the dice, this is here, and now he's just standing back watching the mess until we get to heaven. God is, the, the scripture tells us that everything is created by him, for him, yes. amen, and is sustained the same way, by him. Nothing exists except because of him. Exactly. So we take him out of the equation and there's nothing left. Exactly. But the world goes on because they don't, just because everybody doesn't agree with that or, or recognize that doesn't change the fact that God's still doing it, you know. Right. And, and we, they won't know until the church is out of here, until there is no body of Christ. Then that's what the scriptures call the... Uh, you know, the, the, that's the big word I was looking for. Yeah, the tribulation. Huh? Well, the catching away is what happens and the people that are left. You know, so, you know, tribulation. Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But when we're out of here, there's nothing there to overcome. So the tribulation takes over. Yes. Praise the Lord. Anyway, thank the Lord. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God for us. Praise the Lord. You know, I mean, I'm just glad, amen, to know the Lord, even to the limited degree that I do. And, and, and that's a fact. We just don't know everything about God. How can you? He's God. But we can know more if we continue to seek after him. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, amen, I just have a, you know, I, I'm just kind of on a personal deal uh, about religion, and you know, I I don't mean that in a way that I hate you know religious people or religion. It's just that I see it get in the way of so much that God wants to do. He's not about religion; he's about people. And you know, we we think sometimes, okay, we we've, we've quantified or qualified what what religion is, and we don't know because there's all kinds of religious stuff goes on in our lives that we think is still spiritual. both of you. But there's like a, you know, there's stuff that goes on and we think we're being spiritual and in fact we're being physical, we're being natural. Right. Because we have thought that because, you know, there's this, you know, kind of uh, Presbyterian way of doing things and I don't have anything against Presbyterians, but they're more sedate, they're more, you know, kind of within themselves. And then you go to a Pentecostal church and my God, it's everything is on the outside. <coughs> Talk about wearing your heart on your sleeve. It's, you know, everything is, is external. That's good. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. We're responding to God. But a lot of times, we go looking for that thing that really is nothing but, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not really God. It's not really a spiritual thing. It's just a thing. Praise the Lord. You know, if I... If I did a math equation or, or problem up here and actually got the answer to it, it wouldn't make me a mathematician. It would just mean I knew something about math. Right. Yeah. Uh, it would be a pretty simple equation, I promise you. But I, there are a few that I could do, but it certainly wouldn't make me a mathematician. I can speak English, but it doesn't make me an English professor. Right. <clears throat> and I could prove that by trying to diagram a sentence for you. I know what it's supposed to sound like, so I don't have to diagram it. I was an English major in college, believe it or not. But I hate to have to take some of those tests right now, praise the Lord. Because you prepare for the test. You know? And I don't need to be able to tell you what's an adjective, what's a noun, what's a pronoun, what's an adverb, what's a verb. You, you don't care as long as you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> praise the Lord. And it's the same way with me. That's the way we have to have our relationship with God. 
It isn't about the getting on. We're not studying for a test. Jesus already passed the test. Hallelujah. We've been given an A. We've been giving the highest marks you can get. We've already been qualified, amen, for the, the degree. Yes. Praise God. Now, if you can make any sense out of that, you're way smarter than I am. Praise the Lord. I don't know what I just said. But it sounded good at the time. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. All right, let's just let's do something that does make sense. We'll read some scripture. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, Roberto. Thank the Lord. Amen. I'm just, I'm just glad that I'm learning more and more about having this relationship with Jesus literally does make you free. It really does set you free. Uh, we don't have to have the religious bondages, the ritualistic ways of doing things uh, in order to have this relationship, in order to serve God, in order to have God's influence in our life and in the lives of people around us. We can just be Nana and Popo, right? You, know? you can just be who you are and have influence. You can have God's presence affect others through you just by being you. Exactly. Not being something imaginary, something that you think you should be in order for that to happen. I, I can't tell you, when you go through the scriptures and you see these people that Jesus chose, these are losers. These are people that are all messed up. Amen. And we've got people today that are not doing the things that they could do for God. Not because I'm, that's the test, that's the degree of, or, or the way of knowing how your relationship is with God, but a lot of people are not affecting their lives and the lives of people around them simply because they don't feel qualified. They feel disqualified. But I'm telling you, Jesus has qualified you with all of your problems, with all of your issues. You can still be a positive influence for God. You can still let God work through you. These these people, just the, you just think of the disciples themselves. You had, you had thieves. You had liars. You had uh, revolutionaries. Right. There was all kinds of stuff going on there. Tax collectors and all of this stuff. And yet, Jesus used them. You had liars, people that lie. They're lying one minute and telling the truth the next. Just think of, uh, for, for example, uh, Peter. This guy was as bold as they get. I mean, he had guts, but he didn't have a whole lot of smarts when it, he could, didn't put it together, you know? And so, I'll never leave you. You know, I'll never forsake you. And Jesus said, really? <laughs> before the cock crows three times, you will have denied me. Or he actually said, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. Right. Now, when they went to the to the, after the garden, he couldn't even stay awake long enough to pray. He couldn't stay awake an hour to pray with him. Now, he's, he's going to go die for him, but he couldn't even pray with him. Yeah. Then they get to, the, to, to where the Roman soldiers and the, and the, uh, the priest uh, guard came, the high priest guard came to take Jesus, and Peter jumps up with his sword and cuts off the guy's ear. So he's, he, he's, doing it. he's saying, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. If it happens, I'm going to do this. And it wasn't a couple hours later He's some little girl sees him and hears his, you know, kind of his accent and says, hey, you're a Galilean. You're one of him. You're one of them. The hell I am. That's basically what he said. And he went on to say some other worse words than that that I won't repeat in church. But he, he was swearing and saying, I don't know the guy. I don't know what you're talking about. So he's telling the truth one minute and he's lying the next. Can I get a witness? Hallelujah. I mean, we, that's us. That's the way we are. We're going to do everything this way and then we don't. But we do some of it. We, we mean it when we say it. We just aren't capable. Exactly. Because we're humans. Exactly. But don't let your humanity get in the way of your spirituality. Don't let your humanity keep you from being the person you really are. I mean, if I measure myself by myself, I got a big problem. Well, on the one hand, I'd probably be able to do pretty good if I'm, as long as I keep measuring myself by myself. I might be able to improve that a little bit. The problem is somebody else is going to come along that's better than me. Better behaved. More under control. Now I'm depressed. Now i got to do something else to try to get better. No, he has accepted me as I am. Thank you, Lord. In him. Thank you, Lord. 
Praise God. All right, Hebrews 12, verse 2. We're living defeated lives because we don't understand the way God looks at us. We look at one another and we say, I like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. And we think that God must agree. And we think about ourselves that way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. A couple we talked to a while back said the same thing. They said they were so afraid to step out of anything that they had done, you know, religiously speaking, for fear of God. They love God. They just have a poor image of God. They just don't have a clear perspective or understanding of God. The only way you're going to ever have any kind of security in your relationship with God is looking unto Jesus. Not to yourself, not to somebody else, not to religion. Just look to him. The author and finisher of our faith. Praise the Lord. All right, Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 12. Galatians 3, 8 through 12. I don't know if anybody else ever has these moments, but I have them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, when you get to self-analysis, uh, you know, I took a, a couple of psychology classes in college. One was uh, just Psych 101, and then the other one was uh, Psychology of the Criminally Insane. Oh, I found myself <laughs> everywhere there, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, little information sometimes is worse than no information. Yeah. You know, I, you, you think, well, I'm uncomfortable, you know, in conversation, or, or I feel like I'm faking it sometimes, just pretending to be, you know, conversational, you know? So I'm just, go ahead and do your own analysis here after the service, but, you know, you start thinking thoughts that are just kind of crazy, right? And so I wonder what they thought about that thing that I said, or did they, you know, but here's the deal. You, you, you know, we, we have these, these ideas, these thoughts, they don't stop us from being who we are. No. We just go on doing it. I mean, if I if I want to sit down and really think about it, I I would just you know I'd just become a recluse because it's easier. But yet I see other people, and you know you're ta- you're having a conversation. You're going, you know, sometimes it happens, and you go, oh, that was kind of weird what they said. Or you think about it afterwards. You think, geez, are they? Do they? Is that what they meant? You know what I'm saying? But you don't stop liking them. You don't stop being a friend. You don't stop interacting with them because they said something that was kind of bizarre. Why? Because you recognize, hey, this is a human I'm talking to. And they got all the same giddy-ups that I got. They just, you know, maybe they just don't think about it. God bless them. I wish to God I didn't think about some stuff sometimes because it doesn't, it's not helpful. But we don't judge everybody by everything that they do and say. Because we just accept them, especially if it's family. Think about it. I've got, I've got a weird family. And I'm probably right up there at the top of the list if we were having a weirdness test. But we're still family. We still have, we get along fine. But outside of the family, people might look at that and go, wow, that is about as dysfunctional as I've ever seen. That's just really weird. But it seems normal. It seems normal to us, right? It works for us. Praise the Lord. So sometimes Sally has to call me down from my man cave to bring me back to reality. I I spend too much time thinking up there, praise the Lord, especially this time of year when there's nothing left but one game. (laughs) Uh, We're just dealing with it the best we can, hallelujah. 
Anyway, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So the scripture foreseeing that God was going to justify see, the scripture was foretelling. They, they, it knew what God was going to do because it's God, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So the scripture foreseeing that God would justify who? Not the righteous, not the good people, not the religious people, the heathen. The people that didn't even have a relationship, didn't even want a relationship, didn't know anything about God, and didn't care about God. That he would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel of Abraham. Now, what was the gospel that was preached to Abraham? Faith will justify you. There was no law. There was no temple. There was nothing. Just God and Abram. Amen? Saying, in these shall all nations be blessed. So then... They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So this is what he's saying is that nobody gets, nobody gets to God by doing things. No matter how good they are. The way we get to God is by faith. By believing, because nobody can do the law. Right. You can do some of it, and then we kid ourselves into believing that we're doing all of it. Wow. But if you miss it in one point, you've missed it all. Right. So, as many as are of the works of the law, they're under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Which is just another way of saying what I just said. Amen. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. Because the just will live by faith. And the law is not of faith. You need to write that down. The law is not of faith. It doesn't take any faith to live under the law. It takes discipline. And still you won't be able to do it. Amen. So the law is not of faith. But the man that does them shall live in them. The man that does the law is stuck in it. He doesn't have any other alternative. That's all he's got is, the, is more rules, more law. Amen? So you can bet, just write this down, that you've created a God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. So, and believe me, if you are watching any of the pol politics that are going on right now, and I don't know how you can help it if you have eyes, I hate people on both sides. They're idiots. They're, they're crazy. They, you, you listen to them, you think, what are, they, why, what are they thinking? God surely must be disgusted with this guy or that person or this gal or whatever. I mean, you've created a God in, in, I've created a God in my image. If I feel that way, if I think that way, if I think that God looks at them the way I look at them, I've got something wrong in my thinking. Because God decided a long time ago he was going to justify the heathen by his goodness, yes. by his grace, not by them, not by what they do. I'm not saying everybody's saved that's in politics. I'm, I, that's not my point. I'm just saying God so loved the world. Yes. And it is hard to be in agreement with God sometimes when you're looking at and listening to people that you think just have no right to even probably be on this planet, <laughs> let alone. And I'm, I'm not saying what. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying it's because it's a Democrat or it's a Republican or it's a, you know, a whatever, independent. But no man is justified by the law on the side of God. It's evident, praise the Lord. The, the sad truth is most of the church today is defined more by what we're against than what we're for. We, we, we can tell you what we don't like, what we don't want, what we think is wrong. But what, what, what about God? He said he's for you. Right? He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Right. Praise God. Jesus didn't come to make adjustments, praise the Lord, to people's morality. He came to turn the world upside down. And, if I, and, and when I look at the church and when I look at religion, I don't see it upside down. I see it just logical. I see it the way I would think of it as a natural thinking person. Do good and you'll get good. The way we live in our world. Uh -huh. Work hard and you'll be rewarded. Yeah. Work harder and you'll get a bigger reward. 
right? But that's totally the opposite of what the Bible teaches us. That's not the, the way of the kingdom. It's the way of the world. I'm saying that a, a, a way to live that dwarfs both secularism and moralism is in the person and the finished work of Jesus. That's the only way it'll ever work. It's the only way it can work. It's the way it was intended to work. Praise God. Faith is the opposite of the law. It's the opposite. Law is self-consciousness. Amen? Faith is Christ consciousness. That's what we just read. The law is all about me. Faith, it's all about him. You don't need more faith to receive your miracle. You don't need a faith preacher to pray for you to your miracle. You just need to believe God. And I'm saying we undermine the work of God when we do that. I'm not against people that do it. I'm not, I mean, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying, if that's not upside down, that's not the world upside down, that's what you would think. Somebody good enough will come along and pray for me and get me healed. Right? That's logical thinking. That's not spiritual thinking. Spiritual thinking says, me, this reprobate, this <coughs> failure, this, this goofball, this guy who can't keep two thoughts together for more than 10 minutes at a time, can pray and believe God and be healed. That's, the, that's an upside-down world, but that's the way God intended it to be. That the least of these, amen, shall be the greatest. In the world's eyes, those who are nobodies, amen, will be the first ones into the kingdom. Why? Because they're operating by faith and not by law. Praise the Lord. You don't need more faith to get healed. You don't need more faith for a breakthrough. You don't need more faith for God to move in your life. You just need to be focused on Jesus. You just need to be looking to the author and finisher of your faith. Praise the Lord. Just look to Jesus. Praise God. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. What if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Well, we know better than that. I read the text message that, uh, on Connie's cell phone. Does that doctor's unbelief change the reality of what God has said? No. no. Does the diagnosis change the reality of God? No. Just because they're in unbelief doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't change anything about God. Even if I'm unbelieving, it doesn't change the reality of who God is and what God wants to do. Right. Praise God. Romans 3, uh, 22 through 24. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, and, and this is what we need to see here. He's the author and finisher of our faith, right? The righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all, that would be us, and upon all them that believe. Because there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Being justified freely by his grace. You are justified in the eyes of God, just as if you'd never done a thing, a thing wrong in your life. Yes. Amen. You have been justified Amen. by his grace freely. Yes. You didn't do anything. You didn't do anything to get it. So why do we get so crazy when we get into church thinking that now i got to do something to keep it? You didn't do anything to get it in the first place, except you believed. You believe that God is better than we are, that God is smarter than we are, that God is greater than we are. Amen? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. You have been made righteous by grace, which is the finished work of the cross. Yes. Amen. Yes. 
We need to settle this once and for all. We need to be able to turn things upside down, including our own thinking. If we're ever going to have the impact that God wants to have. How was it Jesus did the things that he did? Because he operated as a man. You could say, well, I, I, can't, I can't believe that because, after all, he was God. But he never operated as God. He never functioned as God. He functioned as a man filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with God, which is the same thing you have if you're born again. If you are a believer, you are identical to Jesus Christ in that respect. What was the difference? The difference was Jesus knew who he was. He came to a conclusion based on the Word of God even because he said... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, amen, to the poor, to set liberty. Those are, and when the enemy came against him, the same way he did against Adam and Eve, when he came to Jesus, and, and like he did with Adam and Eve, he said, uh, are you really, you know, is God really dealing with you fairly here? I mean, after all, if you eat from this fruit, you're going to know good from evil just like God. You'll be like God. They already were like God. They were innocent. They didn't know there was good or evil. Right? There wasn't good or evil until they knew it. Perception is reality, and they didn't know wrong or right. right. They were innocent in the eyes of God. So when the enemy come up to Jesus, he said, if you're the Son of God. And Jesus said, I am the Son of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. The reason he was successful was because he believed in the identity that God had given him yes. through this word. Yes. Praise God. You don't have to conjure up faith for healing. You don't have to conjure up faith for finances. Faith for any breakthrough, for any miracle, is when you see Jesus and his grace. It qualifies you. It makes you an inheritor. It, it gives you a legitimate legal right in the universe and beyond to everything that God has. He has made us partakers of his divine reality. Yep. Praise the Lord. We are his offspring. Yes, we are. We're, not, we're not coming begging, please, please. Give me a handout. No, we're coming. Dad, I need the car tonight. Yeah. Here's the keys. Be home by midnight with the car. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Paul said in Galatians, the law is not of faith. And look at this in Romans chapter 4, verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, then faith is made void. In other words, if they if they're have an inheritance from God based on what they do, then, then faith is non-existent. Right. Amen? And the promise, there's no fact to it. There's no reality to it. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. See, you can't give people the law and expect them to have faith. The law will disqualify them. Sure. See, only faith in his grace qualifies us for our inheritance. Yes. That's what makes us children of God. That's what gives us an inheritance. Not what we do, but who we are. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He justifies the ungodly. Amen? Not by work, not by what we do, but by believing on the justification by grace. We're counted righteous. We are declared righteous. Jesus is the end of all of your struggles. Yes. That's the fact. Amen. It is finished. Amen. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. 
See, instead of focusing on the problem, we ought to be focusing on Jesus. The problem will take care of itself eventually. And if it doesn't, well, you'll go on to be with the Lord with a problem, but by the time you get there, you won't have the problem. Praise the Lord. But focusing on the problem won't fix it. Because we've got all the psychiatry and sociology and psychology and self-help programs and 10 steps this and 10 steps that, we still got problems. Because we ought to be pointing people to Jesus instead of to their problem. They already got the problem. They already know about the problem. Right. Hallelujah. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We're not justified by the, by, by the works of the law. We're not even justified by our faith. We're justified in believing in his faith. Yes. It was him that went to the cross. It was him that was crucified. It was him beaten. It was him that suffered. Yes. And we just believe in the faith that he exercised in doing that. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. By his stripes you were healed. His faith brought him to the place where he suffered that scourging. Exactly. Amen. And all I have to do is believe in that. Exactly. Praise God. Believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Drop down to verse 20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. How many of you can testify to that? I've been crucified with Christ, and yet I still see a whole bunch of me. Yeah. Right? But Christ, but yet it's not me. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's all about him. When Jesus died on the cross, the scripture says he condemned sin in the flesh. Yes. Praise God. Romans chapter 7, uh, verses 18 and 19. And I give all these scriptures mainly so I can irritate Roberto. <laughs> but no, so that you can go back and see this isn't an opinion. This isn't like a doctrinal or a, 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 a <coughs> denominational kind of viewpoint. Yeah. This is the scripture. This is the gospel. And I don't care if it fits anybody's denomination. It certainly didn't fit the denomination I came out of. But denominations are just that. Exactly. For I know that in me, that's in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. No good thing. For to will is present with me. I want to do it. I want to do the right thing. And sometimes I do. But not often. And not regularly. Right? right? So... Sometimes I want to, but dwelleth no good thing. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I, don't, I can't figure it out. Right. Because in me, I want to do the right stuff. Right. But there's all kinds of other things going on in this flesh that's, you know, making it difficult. Sure. Praise the Lord. For the good that I would, I do not. <coughs> but the evil which I would not, that's what I do. Yeah. Now, if that doesn't just kind of define what I was saying earlier about yeah. my own thought patterns... Right? We're, we're confused. That's all. We, we just don't, can't figure it out. We want a rational, natural way of figuring this thing out, step by step, and that'll bring me to my perfect state. Right? Yes. You've already been perfected in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, look at this. Look at what it says in it. I, it's all about I. Me, mm -hmm. mine, the focus is on me. That's why I got a problem here trying to get this thing straightened out because I'm focused on I got a problem. Yeah. Me is not so good. Mine is all messed up. <laughs> right? Yeah. That's, that's natural. That's human nature. That's, that's natural for a human. Yeah. But we are supernatural. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. The answer, look at this, verse 24, 724. Oh, wretched man that I am, who is going to deliver me from the body of this death? This, this thing that's got me all messed up, that's got me trying to figure out how to do it, and I can't. It's got me frustrated because of that. Who can deliver me? Look at the answer, verse 25. Thank God through Jesus Christ. 
it, the focus is now not I, me, mine. It's now Jesus. Yes. Thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. I try to do it. I want to do it. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Now then, in Christ, we step into Romans 8, verse 1, which happens to be the very next verse. There is therefore now no condemnation. Yes. None. Yes. To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And here is a word for you this morning. Sin cannot penetrate your spirit. It is stuck on the outside. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are perfected in him. Sin cannot get to you. It can only affect the flesh. And the flesh is not you. The flesh is your vehicle. I'm your vehicle, baby. <laughs> Take you anywhere you want to go, praise the Lord. For those of you who weren't into that music, talking about the guy in the big black sedan, hallelujah. So I'm just saying, <laughs> that's all we are. We're a ride. Yep. We're, uh, we're what gives us the legitimacy, the body I'm talking about, the flesh, gives us the legitimacy to be on this planet. But it's our spirit by which we are identified, either as alive in the spirit or dead in the spirit. We are either alive to Christ or dead. There's no in-between. And when you got born again, you came alive to Christ. You were given God life, eternal life. And until you do that, you're dead. Praise the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who not, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And that's not talking about doing good. It's talking about being born again. Because once you're born again, you are totally identified, as far as God's concerned, by your spirit. Because God is a spirit. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Because you see, we, we think, just like I said before, when we hate, when we, th when we hate somebody, we, we make God in our image because we assume God hates them too. We, that's as much about me as it is about somebody else. There's enough self-loathing in most of us to deal with all of our issues. I mean, as far as if we want to punish ourselves. And in fact, that's part of the reason we do the stuff we do. <laughs> we want a different identity. Even though we can't escape our own identity, we try to get other people to give us another identity. Yeah. That's why you have multiple relationships. That's why you have uh, drug abuse. That's why you have, you know, alcohol abuse. And, and uh, you know, all the things that we do, we do out of a, this, I, I would like to be better, but I'm not. And I know that, so I, I fake it. I'm saying, that's what I was talking about here in the very beginning. Sometimes I think about my life and I think, you know, geez, it would be more comfortable to just be, Alone. I mean, totally. Right? Now, it would, be, it would be sad and it would be depressing at times, but at least I, I, I could just be me. Got to be me. Praise the Lord. You know what I mean? I could be comfortable with all of my uncomfortableness. I wouldn't feel like I was being judged. I wouldn't feel like I was being critiqued. I wouldn't feel like I... Got to be careful about saying that. Well, that was a stupid thing. You know, who cares? But we, here it is, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Yes. Whatever I am, I am. Yes. But the good that I am is God. Exactly. And the rest of it is just yes. not worth worrying about. It doesn't exist anyway, not to God. Right. Praise the Lord. It's his life operating in us. It's his grace. It's his faith. It's him. Amen. 
It's not us. It's not about us. And religion has made it all about us. We're measuring all the time. You got the list. You got to keep it. Right? Know this, know that, know that. And I mean, we, I, I was in an organization that had a really long list. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And in fact, it was growing all the time. Yeah. Praise the Lord. But it wasn't about that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 9 through 13. Hebrews 8, 9 through 13. It's him in us. It's his grace. It's his faith. Yes. Praise God. That's that treasure we have in this clay pot. Praise the Lord. I got a sign back there in my office. Somebody gave it to me. I can't remember now, but he said, we're all cracked pots. But that's a good thing because that's the only way the light gets out. Yes. It's in our failures and our weakness <coughs> that God is glorified. Yes. Yes. So throughout eternity, he will be glorified because of his grace. Yes. We'll all be having a big time in heaven and on earth for eternity. And we will know how important grace was. We will celebrate it for eternity, and so will all of creation. Yes. Praise the Lord, because it's the only way any of us could be redeemed, including the creation. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them. This is the Lord speaking, and he said, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Why did he turn his back on? Because they didn't keep the covenant. Right. They weren't keeping the law. Right. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, I'll write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Under the old covenant law, it was about people trying their best to be faithful servants to God. Eventually, God said he turned away from them because they couldn't do it. They couldn't be righteous enough to be in his presence because they couldn't keep the law. And in fact, I, I mentioned this before, but in, uh, even when Israel broke the law, if you go back and look at historically, when they were taken into captivity or when, they, when God turned his back on them, it wasn't just because they were sinning. It was because they had turned <coughs> from God to idols. Yeah. What does that mean? It means now they don't have a sacrifice. Right. Because the law had its own uh, kind of... Uh, ability to cover itself through the sacrificial system. Right. So even though they couldn't keep the law, they had sacrifices that would protect them from their inability to keep the law. Right. But when they turn to other gods, now they don't have a sacrifice. Right. So now God has no choice. He has to turn his back on them. Right. Not because they're you know, sinning. They were always sinning. But because now there's no blood to cover it. Right. There's no atonement. There's, no, uh, there's nothing to hold back the, the, the wrath of God. So it wasn't just because they were unable to keep the law. It was because not only were they unable to keep the law, which they never were able to do, but now they have nothing between that law and God. Right. And that's why we have, you know, it says God spoke to, to Moses, or, yeah, to Moses, and he spoke from the mercy seat. And that's what he told him was, I'm not going to be angry with these people forever. What was the difference between that and Mount Sinai? The difference was he spoke from the mercy seat, it says. He spoke from the place. Jesus is our elasterion, which is the mercy seat. That's what that word means. And what that means is inside that Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments on ta tablets of stone. And as long as we have a mercy seat, there's something between us and the repercussions for not keeping those laws. And that thing or that person is Christ. The mercy seat. And God spoke to Moses from the mercy seat and he said, I'm not always going to deal with you this way. The day is coming when I won't hold their sins against them. Hallelujah. Their iniquities I won't remember anymore. Hallelujah. I'll write them in their heart. Yes. But he said that from the mercy seat. Amen? From Mount Sinai, he said, keep the law, you're all going to die. In fact, don't even get near this mountain. Right. Even a dog or a goat or a cat, anything comes close, it's going to die. Right. Praise the Lord. 
So he saith, the new covenant, he hath made the first one old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Praise God. See, under the new way, all of that changed. It's about the obedient work of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And our spiritual growth comes from what God is already working in us, not in what we're doing. Spiritual growth doesn't come through your flesh. It comes by the spirit. That treasure that we have in earthen vessels. It isn't us that does it. We can't take credit for any of it. Look at this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Any growth that we have is coming from God out. <coughs> Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. He started it. He finishes it. That's right. And he does what's in between. Amen. Praise the Lord. Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. In fact, I think, go back to uh, verse 18, Roberto. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. So you don't think that I'm just trying to give you an easy way out. I can't give you anything. But Jesus did come to set you free. Yes. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Right. Praise the Lord. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Who was he talking to? He was talking to those people that were under the law. Yes. And I will give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke. It's easy. Listen, that's a whole different argument than what I hear in most churches. Yoke up with Jesus and then pull like the devil because he's probably dragging his feet just to see if you're ser serious, you know? Yeah. Just like a tug of war. You're not always sure if the guy behind you is really pulling. Right. You know, you're working your tail off and you're thinking he's riding off of you, you know? Pull! Will you Pull! Uh, you know, I mean, that's the way we get with Jesus. Come on, pull, man, pull. I'm working like a dog. You won't work, relax. Yeah. His yoke is supposed to be easy. Right. If you're pulling, it's like what Roberto was saying here at the very beginning, and Tim, you know, spoke to the same thing. If you're doing all the pulling, you know, you, you, you don't recognize who's next to you, who's hooked up to you on this side. You know, that's Jesus. Give him. Let him have the burden. Cast all your care upon him. He cares for you, right? Let no man beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Uh, Self-abasement. Right. I mean, you know, well, if I fast longer, God will do something for me. And I'm not against fasting, but the motives are screwed up a lot of times. Or I'm not going to go here. Or I'm not going to have one of these. Or I won't look at that. And I won't do this. And I won't do that. And I won't dress that way. And I won't dress like this. And I, I won't grow a beard. Or I won't cut my hair, I, I, whatever. Let nobody beguile you of your reward in voluntary humility. Right. In other words, in what you do. Worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his own fleshly mind, mm -hmm. which would describe about three-fourths of Christianity. And not holding the head. What's the head? He is the head. Right. So we lose track of the head. In other words, we're not holding the head in esteem. We're not paying attention, right? not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. It's the head that holds everything together and it increases by the increase of God, not by the body. That's right. It's by the head everything happens. Right. Yes. Now you're wondering why I did that in front of all of you. Well, I couldn't have done it without a head. I couldn't have done it without thinking. You can't do anything without thinking. You can't pick your nose. You can't pick a seat, praise the Lord. You, hallelujah, you can't do anything without thinking a thought first. And he is the head. Yes. But we're trying to do stuff out here. We look, I'm sure to the angelic beings, we must look, you know, like we're, I don't know, having some sort of fits. Because the body's certainly not doing what the head's saying to do. The body's just doing stuff thinking it's in charge. Yeah. But we're not holding the head. Praise God. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Amen. It's God that does it. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.13.
2 Timothy 2, 13, 2 uh, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. <laughs> Even when you struggle to believe, He's still faithful because he can't be anything other than what he is. He's a healer whether you believe it or not. Yes. Praise God. If you ever wonder why, why everything looks so different in the Old Testament, this is why. It's the same God, different covenant. It's not a different God. It's the same God. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He showed up in the flesh. So that they could see a true identity. So they could actually recognize this God. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and go. It would fall on people for divine acts of service. I, I won't have you go there for the sake of time, but in Psalms 51 11, you can look it up for yourself. David said, Lord, please help me and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That was the fear of everybody under the Old Covenant. That God would leave, that God would come and God would go. But here's the deal. If you go to the New Testament, the writers, anywhere you look into the New Covenant, from the book of Acts on, you don't find any of these writers wrestling with maintaining God's presence. Right. You don't see him begging to stay or to come. He's here. He's, he's not going anywhere. Right. Praise the Lord. So what's the only thing? that caused the Spirit of God to depart from Adam and Eve? It's not a trick question. Sin. Right? right? right. All right. What's the only thing that could cause Jesus to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had all of our sin right. on him. Right. He's hanging on the cross. Right. He was bearing the sin of the world. What's the only thing that would cause the Spirit of God to depart from you today? Sin. Ah, but what did Jesus do with our sin? He took them away forever. John 1, 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming into him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he hath perfected. Everybody want to underline that. By one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If you're sanctified, it just means you're set apart to God. You've been born again. Praise God. That's why the Spirit of God will never leave us. That's the simple, logical, liberating difference of God's new way of grace. Yeah. You can be a failure in the flesh and be born again. Come on. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Permanent relationship, permanent indwelling by God's Spirit, no matter what. Even when you commit sins. Blasphemy! Even when you commit sins, he remembers them no more. Or oh, you're telling people to go ahead and sin. I don't have to tell them to do anything because we all do it anyhow. Now, we might have greater judgment of sin. I mean, I'm saying I might look at one sin and say, oh, that's a lot worse than this sin of mine over here. No, it's all sin. If, it's, if you fail at one, you fail at all. Right. doesn't matter. There's no big sin and little sin as far as God's concerned. It's just Either you are or you're not. The good news is you're not if you're a believer. You are perfected in him. So that the motivation comes from a, 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 a relational attitude rather than a fear attitude. The woman that was caught in the act of adultery, Jesus said, I don't condemn you. I'm not condemning you either. Go and sin no more. Now, does that mean that if she ever sinned again that she'd be lost? No. He was saying the only way you're ever going to ever get past this is by recognizing there's no judgment on you even when you fail. I've accepted you just like you are. Thank you, Praise the Lord.
That is the simple, logical, liberating difference of God's way of doing things. Even when you commit sins, he doesn't remember them. Hebrews 8 and 12. We're about done. Please hang in here just a moment. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Even when we are totally disobedient, he remains faithful. The Holy Spirit is sealed in us. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. even when we're totally disobedient. See, there's a lot of debate about uh, law and grace. Should we adopt some of the laws? I mean, they keep people a little bit straighter. I mean, don't we need a balance? But the truth is, 99% of the people that are arguing about this are Gentiles who were never given the law in the first place. For us, it is the new covenant, or it's nothing at all. If you don't accept the new covenant, you better convert to Judaism, because you don't have any other alternative. The law was not given to the Gentiles. It was given to the Jews as an example for us to see how demanding, how holy, how righteous God is, and that it's impossible for man to keep it. The Gentiles got a pass here. We really got the blessing. Isn't that what what the Bible teaches us? That he bypassed them and came to us. Now, he hasn't given up on them. He hasn't turned his back on them. They will be saved. But I'm saying, they're going to get saved the same way we got saved. By grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let, let's enjoy it. Enjoy everything from Genesis to Revelation, right? The whole Bible. The, the, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. But let's also recognize that there's a surprise ending to this story. It's called the cross, yeah. the resurrection. Praise God. Amen. So in the, because of that, We need to reinterpret the beginning of the story. This wasn't about a God that came here to get everybody. This is about a God who came because he loved humanity, created humanity for his own enjoyment, his own pleasure, and for our pleasure. Praise the Lord. So we need to look at this in the revelation of the entire Scripture. And look at it through what has been revealed in the new covenant. Because the old covenant has passed away. He told us it's over. So if we're going to look at the old covenant, look at the old covenant through the prism, if you will, of the new covenant. Otherwise, you're getting a, a bum look. You're not, you're not seeing it clearly. So look at the old covenant that is now obsolete and look at it through the lens of the new covenant and rest in the finished work of Jesus. One more scripture and we'll quit. John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. John uh, John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. He gives us God life or eternal life. And we never perish. Neither can anybody take them out of his hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We are secure. We are safe. We are eternal in Christ. Amen. Focus on him. Don't, 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 major, don't make your problem major, the major issue. 
make Jesus the major issue and the problems will take care of themselves eventually. Amen. In the meantime, just thank God for grace as you're going through whatever it is you're dealing with. Yes. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And he wasn't just talking to people that were doing it right. Because nobody's doing it right. Exactly. Amen? Yeah. Nobody ever has, nobody ever will except Jesus. And he did it for you. Amen. You are accepted in the beloved. He is his beloved son in whom God is well pleased. And because we are accepted in the blood, we can say the very same thing about ourselves. God has declared us righteous, holy, <clears throat> beloved inheritors of all that God has. Hallelujah. That's a good deal. Praise the Lord. There's nothing being withheld from you. Don't believe the lie of Adam and Eve. He's not withholding healing. He's not withholding deliverance. He's not withholding financial blessing. He just asks you to believe and it shall come to pass. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> amen, amen. God bless all of you. Amen. Just, let's, let's just live in the freedom that God has given us and enjoy it. Yes. And see if it doesn't change the things around you. Praise God. God bless you all. Dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week.